The detachment ambushed the enemy's Death's Head tank division near Shapino, north of Belgorod, and took prisoners. From the prisoners, we learned that the Germans were heading toward Oboyan. By the end of the day, the main force of the 52nd Guards Rifle Division was positioned north of Belgorod, and the enemy was unable to dislodge the guardsmen from their defensive positions. By March 20th, 21, the main forces of the 21st Army had established a strong defence north of Belgorod, and parts of the 1st Tank Army were massed in reserve south of Oboyan. By the end of March, the enemy made several unsuccessful attempts to break through our defences near Belgorod and along the northern Donets River, where the 64th Army was deployed. After suffering heavy losses, the German troops began fortifying their positions. From that point, the situation in the Kursk salient stabilised, as both sides prepared for the decisive battle. Strengthening command in an effort to strengthen the command of the Voronezh Front, Stalin appointed General N. F. Vatutin as the new front commander. With his characteristic energy, Vatutin immediately began work on creating a deep defence system. He and I visited almost all front units at the end of March and early April, assisting commanders in assessing the situation and clarifying their objectives. I was particularly concerned about the situation in the 52nd Guards Rifle Division, whose sector I visited twice during this period. I believed this division would bear the brunt of an enemy attack. Vatutin and Army Commander General Chistyakov agreed with my assessment, and we decided to strengthen the sector with additional artillery. Intelligence Gathering and Analysis By agreement with Marshal Vasilevsky and the front commanders, the general staff took steps to obtain excellent intelligence on the sectors of the Central, Voronezh and Southwest Fronts. Vasilevsky issued orders to gather information on the location of enemy reserves and troop concentrations, particularly in areas where forces had been transferred from France, Germany and other countries. Each front command undertook systematic aerial and ground reconnaissance. By early April, we had gathered detailed intelligence on enemy forces near Orel, Sumy, Belgorod and Kharkov. After analysing this information with the commanders of the Voronezh and Central Fronts and discussing it with Vasilevsky, I sent the following report to Supreme Commander-in-Chief Stalin on April 8th. Herewith is my report on possible enemy operations in the spring and summer of 1943, as well as my conclusions on our defensive operations in the near future. 1. Enemies' Limited Offensive Capabilities the enemy has suffered heavy losses during the winter campaign of 1942-43 and, as a result, will likely be unable to assemble sufficient reserves by spring to continue his advance into the Caucasus and toward the Volga River. His offensive will likely be limited to a narrower front, focusing on a series of staged operations with the ultimate goal of seizing Moscow. 2. Initial Enemy Offensive Plan the enemy is expected to concentrate up to 13 or 15 tank divisions, along with significant air support, to strike in two main directions, from the orel kromi group, bypassing Kursk from the northeast, and from the Belgorod-Karkov group, bypassing Kursk from the southeast. An auxiliary strike may come from the west near Vorojba, between the Saim and Tsel rivers, directed against Kursk from the southwest. The enemy's objective will likely be a line running through Karocha, Tim and Droskovo. 3. Flanking attacks and further strikes. In the second stage, the enemy may attempt to strike against the flank and rear of the southwest front, aiming for Valuiki and Urazovo. They may also push northward from Lysychansk towards Svatovo and Urazovo. Elsewhere, the enemy might aim for a line through Livni, Kastornoye, Stari Oskol and Novi Oskol. 4. Subsequent Stage Offensive Plans After regrouping, the enemy may attempt to advance toward Liski, Voronezh and Yelets, seeking to outflank Moscow via Rannenberg, Ryazhsk and Ryazan. 5. Enemy Reliance on Tanks and Air Force The enemy will likely place the most emphasis on his tank divisions and air force, as his infantry appears less prepared for offensive operations compared to the previous year. The enemy could field up to 16 tank divisions with a combined strength of 2,500 tanks against our Kursk grouping. 
6. Defensive measures. To counter this threat, we should strengthen anti-tank defences on the central and Voronezh fronts, assemble 30 anti-tank artillery regiments in Supreme Headquarters Reserve, and concentrate self-propelled artillery along key lines, placing some at the disposal of Rokossovsky and Vatutin. Additionally, air strength should be concentrated in reserve to conduct massed air attacks in conjunction with tanks and rifle units to disrupt enemy operations. I also recommend positioning operational reserves around Yefremov, Livny, Kastonoye, Novi Oskol, Valuiki, Rossosh, Liski, Voronezh and Yelets, with deeper reserves at Ryazhysk, Rannenberg and Tambov. A reserve army should be stationed in the Tula and Stalinogorsk area. I do not consider it wise to launch a preventive attack at this time. It would be better to wear down the enemy with our defences, destroy his tanks, and then, after moving up fresh reserves, transition to a general offensive to destroy his main forces. On April 9th or 10, Marshal Vasilevsky arrived at the Voronezh Front headquarters. We reviewed my report, and there was unanimous agreement on the assessment and strategic direction. We drafted a directive for Supreme Headquarters about the disposition of reserves and the establishment of a new step front in the rear of the Kursk salient. This directive was sent to Supreme Headquarters for Stalin's approval. On April 10th, General Malinin, Chief of Staff of the Central Front, submitted his report to the General Staff. His analysis confirmed our assessment that the enemy would likely focus on the Kursk-Voronezh operational direction for his spring-summer offensive. General Malinin's report outlined the most probable enemy offensive directions, including a strike from Orel through Livni toward Kastonoye and from Belgorod through Oboyan toward Kursk, a secondary strike from Orel through Kromi toward Kursk and from Belgorod through Stari Oskol toward Kastornoye. Malinin recommended that the combined forces of the Western, Bryansk and Central Fronts strike at the enemy's grouping around Orel to prevent his offensive and secure key railroads. He also recommended reinforcing the Central and Voronezh Fronts with air support and additional anti-tank artillery. By mid-April, Supreme Headquarters had not finalised the concrete plan of action for our forces in the Kursk salient. The front commanders were directed to prepare for defence while reserves were being formed. However, by April 12th, preparations for a defence in depth around the Kursk salient were well underway. Stalin emphasised that while the Kursk sector was a priority, we must also remain vigilant on the Moscow front. We decided to concentrate our main forces around Kursk and prepare reserves near threatened sectors. The preparations for the spring-summer campaign of 1943 included a thorough review and improvement of the Soviet Army's organisational structure. The artillery and tank units were reinforced, and additional resources were devoted to air defence, including new self-propelled guns and the formation of heavy tank regiments. In addition, the Army's communications and logistical capabilities were strengthened. By July 1st, Supreme Headquarters reserves had grown significantly, with several field armies, two tank armies, and one air army available. The improvements in manpower, equipment and political work had greatly enhanced the Soviet forces' fighting capacity and morale. The preparation and organisation of the forces, along with the efficient use of reserves, laid the foundation for a successful defence against the German offensive and, eventually, the counter-offensive that would lead to victory in the Battle of Kursk. Here is the text formatted for readability with appropriate paragraph breaks and some structural organisation to help guide the reader through the content. A decree of the Central Committee, dated May 24, 1943, on the reorganisation of the structure of party and young communist organisations in the Red Army, and giving a greater role to the army newspapers, facilitated this work. According to the decree, party organisations were to be established at the battalion rather than the regimental level. Regimental party bureaus were to become equivalent to party committees. This structure made possible more effective control of party members in the lower units. The political work of commanders, political commissars, party and young communist organisations in implementing the May Decree 
was a major factor in raising the military preparedness level of the Soviet armed forces on the eve of large-scale fighting with the enemy in the spring-summer campaign of 1943. More than 200,000 guerrillas were operating in the rear of the enemy. These were directed by the central headquarters of the guerrilla movement and by underground committees in cities, districts and provinces. By the summer of 1943, before the Battle of Kursk, the Soviet armed forces were superior to the German fascist forces, both quantitatively and qualitatively. The Soviet Supreme Command now had at its disposal all the necessary means to hold the strategic initiative in all sectors and dictate its will to the enemy. The German command, realising that its armed strength had lost its superiority over the Soviet army, undertook a series of total measures to shift all available forces to the Soviet-German front. Taking advantage of the West's failure to open a second front, the Nazi command moved its best forces to the east. The German war industry, working 24 hours a day, rushed to provide the troops with new Tiger and Panther tanks and Ferdinand self-propelled guns. The German Air Force received new Focke-Wulf 190A and Henschel 129 planes. German ground forces were given additional manpower and supplies. Germany's strength on the Soviet front included 232 German and satellite divisions, totalling 5.3 million men, 56,000 guns and mortars, 5,850 tanks and self-propelled guns, and 3,000 planes. Headquarters at all levels were intensely busy with plans for the coming offensive. For the operations against the Kursk salient, the German command intended to use at least 50 divisions, including 16 tank and motorised divisions, 10,000 guns, 2,700 tanks and 2,000 planes. Hitler and his clique had no doubt about their success. Nazi propaganda did all it could to instil confidence in the troops and promised that the impending battle would yield the certain victory that Hitler wanted to achieve at all cost. But once again, the adventurist plans of German imperialism were to be frustrated. In early May, I returned to Supreme Headquarters from a trip to the North Caucasus Front. By that time, the General Staff had completed its basic plans for the spring-summer campaign. Intensive intelligence gathering in the enemy rear and by air had clearly established that the main flow of enemy troops and materiel was in the direction of Orel, Kromi, Bryansk, Kharkov, Krasnograd and Poltava. This confirmed our April forecast. Both the Supreme Command and the General Staff began to suspect that the Germans might begin their offensive within the next few days. Stalin demanded that the Central, Bryansk, Voronezh and Southwest Fronts be warned to hold their forces in complete readiness to meet the expected onslaught. The relevant directive was issued by Supreme Headquarters on May 8th. Upon receipt of the directive, the Front Commands took additional measures to strengthen their firing systems, anti-tank defences and engineering obstacles. One report from the Central Front Command in response to this directive read as follows. 1. After receipt of the Supreme Headquarters Directive, orders were issued to all armies and independent corps of the Central Front to get their troops into battle readiness by the morning of May 10th. 2. The following steps were taken on May 9th and 10. Troops were informed about a possible enemy offensive in the immediate future. Units in the first and second echelons, as well as reserves, were brought up to complete readiness. Unit commands and headquarters staff verified troop readiness on the spot. Field intelligence and artillery harassment of the enemy were intensified, especially in the Orel direction. Fire control systems were verified in practice by first-line units. Second-line units and reserves conducted additional reconnaissance and coordinated plans with front-line units. Additional supplies of ammunition were moved up to firing positions. Field obstacles were reinforced, especially in sectors vulnerable to tank attacks. Defence zones were mined in depth, and communications were checked to ensure they were working without fault. 3. The 16th Air Army intensified its reconnaissance and carefully observed the enemy in the areas of Glazunova, Orel, Kromi and Komarichi. Air units and army troops were in complete readiness to repulse enemy airstrikes and break up any offensive operations. 
4. To counter any enemy offensive in the Orel Kursk direction, the entire artillery of the 13th Army and the planes of the 16th Air Army were alerted for possible counter preparation. Similar reports were received from other fronts. Although they did not deny the need for defensive measures, General Vatutin, the commander of the Voronezh Front, and his political officer, N.S. Khrushchev, proposed a preventive strike against the enemy's Belgorod Kharkov grouping. However, Vasilevsky, Antonov, and the other officers in the general staff did not support this idea. I agreed with the general staff and reported this to Stalin. Despite this, Stalin remained uncertain whether to await the enemy offensive or strike a preventive blow. Stalin feared our defences might not be able to withstand the enemy's onslaught, as had happened in 1941 and 1942. At the same time, he was not sure our troops would be able to break through the strong enemy defences. This doubt persisted until almost mid-May. After repeated discussions and the evidence we supplied him, Stalin finally decided to meet the German attack with artillery fire, airstrikes and counter-attacks by our operational and strategic reserves. Then, having worn down the enemy, we would launch our own powerful counter-offensive in the Belgorod Kharkov and Orel directions, followed by deep-ranging offensive operations in all major directions. After the defeat of the Germans in the Kursk salient, Supreme Headquarters proposed liberating the Donets Basin and the entire Ukraine east of the Dnieper River, eliminating the enemy bridgehead on the Taman Peninsula in the northern Caucasus and reaching the eastern part of Byelorussia, thus preparing the way for the complete expulsion of the enemy from Soviet territory. The main German forces in the Kursk salient were to be defeated according to the following plan of Supreme Headquarters. As soon as the enemy's main concentrations in the jumping-off areas for the offensive were identified, all artillery and mortar units were to open fire in coordination with aerial strikes. While assisting defensive operations on the ground, our air force was to win complete mastery in the air, with help from air units from neighbouring fronts and the long-range force of the Supreme Command. When the enemy launched its ground offensive, the troops of the Voronezh and Central Fronts were to defend every position, every firing line, and launch counter-attacks with available reserves, including individual tank corps and entire tank armies. As soon as the enemy was weakened and brought to a halt, a major Soviet counter-offensive was to be launched by the forces of the Voronezh, Central, Steppe and Bryansk Fronts, as well as the left wing of the Western Front and the right wing of the Southwest Front. In accordance with this general plan of action, a Supreme Headquarters directive made the following specific assignments to the individual fronts. Central Front. Defend the northern part of the Kursk salient, wear down the enemy, and then, in conjunction with the Bryansk and Western Fronts, launch a counter-offensive to defeat the German forces around Orel. Voronezh Front. Defend the southern part of the Kursk salient, inflict maximum losses on the enemy in defensive operations, and then, in coordination with the steppe front and the right wing of the southwest front, launch a counter-offensive to smash the enemy forces around Belgorod and Kharkov. The main effort was to be concentrated on the left wing in the sector of the 6th and 7th Guards armies. Steppe front. Prepare for defence in case of a breakthrough on the central or Bryansk fronts, and be ready to take part in counter-offensive operations. Bryansk Front Operate in conjunction with the Central Front to blunt the enemy's offensive and be ready to go over to the counter-offensive in the Orel direction. Guerrilla Movement Organise massive diversionary actions in the enemy rear against major transport lines in Orel, Bryansk, Kharkov and other oblasts and gather intelligence information. Our troops began preparing for the Battle of Kursk in the second half of April. I spent much of that period with the troops of the Voronezh and Central Fronts, studying the situation and preparations for the anticipated operations. On May 22nd, I sent the following report to Stalin, addressing him by the code name of Ivanov. Herewith is my report on the situation at the Central Front as of May 21st. 1. Enemy forces. Our intelligence has established that, as of May 21st, the enemy has 15 infantry divisions in the front line and 13 divisions, 
including three tank divisions in the second line, in the Kursk region. In addition, two more divisions have been identified moving from the south. As of the morning of May 21st, enemy forces were increasing their concentration in the Orel Kursk sector. The presence of German forces at Kromi and in the area west of Orel is confirmed. 2. Our forces. At the Central Front, we have positioned five infantry divisions, two tank divisions and a number of artillery units to strengthen defensive positions along our front. Combat formations of the 5th, 7th and 9th armies are on full alert and fortifications are being reinforced. 3. Troop movements. In response to intelligence reports, we have moved additional reserves into the front lines. Several battalions and corps are on standby to reinforce positions as required. 4. Air operations. The 16th Air Army has intensified air reconnaissance in the region and is prepared to take full control of the airspace to support ground operations. 5. Counter-offensive preparations. The counter-offensive, as planned by the General Staff, is ready for implementation as soon as the enemy's initial assault is blunted. We are coordinating closely with neighbouring fronts to ensure the best possible response to the enemy's movements. Cover for our forces in the Kursk salient was provided by the 2nd, 5th and 16th Air Armies, as well as two fighter divisions of the Soviet Air Defence Forces. Our anti-aircraft defences were greatly reinforced in anticipation of the expected enemy offensive. By July, the Central Front had deployed five anti-aircraft divisions from the Supreme Headquarters Reserve, five regiments of medium-caliber artillery and 23 regiments of small-caliber artillery. The Voronezh Front had four anti-aircraft divisions from the Supreme Headquarters Reserve, 25 anti-aircraft regiments, three additional anti-aircraft divisions and five anti-aircraft batteries. These forces enabled the fronts to cover numerous objectives with double, triple, quadruple and even quintuple fire. The anti-aircraft units were closely integrated with fighter aircraft, as well as observation, early warning and communications services. This well-prepared air defence system in the Kursk salient allowed us to effectively protect our forces and inflict heavy losses on the enemy's air force. Our fortification zone stretched more than 100 miles deep, including the national defence line along the Don River, extending to 150 to 175 miles. The fronts were thus well prepared to defend our troops and effectively counter the enemy's offensive. Rear services contributions, much work was also done by the rear services of the fronts, armies and smaller units. Though often overlooked, the support services played a critical role by providing labour and creative initiative that greatly aided the troops and commanders at all levels. Their contribution was instrumental in the defeat of the enemy and our eventual victory. The rear services of the Central Front were led by General N. A. Antipenko, while those of the Voronezh Front were led by General N. P. Anisimov. I knew both generals well. Antipenko had commanded the rear services of the 49th Army during the Battle of Moscow and had proven himself to be an able organiser. I became more familiar with Anisimov during my time as commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front. Supplying more than 1.3 million soldiers, 3,600 tanks, 20,000 guns and 3,130 planes, including long-range bombers for the Battle of Kursk, was an enormous logistical task. Despite difficult conditions, the rear services handled their duties brilliantly, ensuring a steady flow of provisions during both the defensive phase and the rapid shift to the counter-offensive. The local residents of the Kursk salient also played a crucial role, helping with the construction of fortifications, repairing equipment and contributing to the building and repairing of roads. Industrial plants near the front line repaired tanks, planes, trucks and artillery, and sewed uniforms and hospital garments. Their efforts were indispensable, and it can truly be said that the front and rear worked as one. Everyone did their utmost to achieve victory, which was clear evidence of the shared goals of our people and armed forces in the fight for their socialist homeland. Generals Vatutin and Rokossovsky personally dealt with many rear service problems, which contributed significantly to the excellent supply situation at the start of the battle.
Preparations and Intelligence Through May and June, intensive military and political training took place in all ground and air units as each soldier and commander prepared for the expected enemy offensive. Intelligence provided by Supreme Headquarters and the individual fronts helped us predict the enemy's timing. On July 2nd, Supreme Headquarters warned front commanders that the enemy could launch their offensive between July 3rd and 6th. On July 4th, I was at Central Front Headquarters. A telephone conversation over a high-security line with Marshal Vasilevsky, who was at Vatutin's headquarters, informed me that an engagement had occurred near Belgorod and the enemy offensive was expected to begin at dawn on July 5th. A captured soldier from the 168th Infantry Division had confirmed that the German forces would attack at 5.30am. I relayed this information to Rokossovsky and Malinin, and after 2 a.m. on July 5th, General Pukov of the 13th Army called to report a captured sapper stating that the Germans would launch their offensive at around 3 a.m. Rokossovsky asked, What shall we do? Inform Supreme Headquarters or issue orders for the preliminary bombardment ourselves. We can't waste time, I replied. Give the order according to plan and I'll call Stalin to report the information. I was immediately connected to the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, Stalin, who had just finished speaking with Vasilevsky. I informed him about the prisoner's information and the decision to initiate the preliminary counter-attack bombardment. Stalin approved the decision and asked to be kept informed. He would be at Supreme Headquarters awaiting events. The tension in the air was palpable. Despite our thorough preparations, none of us felt like sleeping. Rokossovsky and I were in the office of the Chief of Staff, General Malinin, who had served as Chief of Staff during the Battle of Moscow. He and his team of brilliant officers, including Operations Chief General the Fourth Boykov and Artillery Chief Colonel G.S. Nadisev, were all engaged in coordinating artillery fire for the counter-offensive. The Preliminary Bombardment At 2.20am, the ground shook as the mighty symphony of the battle began. The sounds of heavy artillery and M31 rockets echoed across the area. During the bombardment, Stalin called again. Well, have you begun? Yes, we have. What's the enemy doing? he asked. I replied that the enemy was attempting to respond with fire from a few batteries. Stalin acknowledged this and said, All right, I'll call again. While we could not immediately assess the result of the preliminary bombardment, it was clear that the Germans had suffered heavily. Prisoners later reported that our bombardment had caught them off guard, causing significant damage to their artillery and disrupting their communications and control systems. However, our fire lacked the precision we had hoped for. Due to insufficient intelligence on the exact locations of enemy troop concentrations, much of our fire was aimed at broad areas rather than specific targets which allowed the enemy to avoid even heavier losses. German planes also launched their attacks too early, before we could mount effective strikes on their airfields. Although our bombardment inflicted heavy losses, we had expected better results. The German offensive and Soviet defence. On July 5th, the Germans launched their offensive, but their attack was poorly coordinated. The enemy's advance was met by the full force of our defence, and despite repeated assaults, they made little progress. Although enemy units pushed into our defences in a few sectors, Soviet troops, especially those in the 13th Army, held firm. The day saw remarkable acts of heroism, including from the 81st Division under General A. B. Barinov and the 15th Division under Colonel V. N. Janjagava, who held their ground despite overwhelming odds. Despite their strong defences, the Germans advanced up to six miles on July 5th and 6th, but their efforts to break through were repeatedly repulsed. By July 7th, the enemy began attacking again, focusing on Paneri. Despite their tank reinforcements, they were unable to break through our defensive lines. The counter-offensive begins. By July 9th, the enemy was beginning to lose hope of breaking through. Stalin called me at the Bryansk command centre and suggested... Isn't it about time to throw in the Bryansk front and the left wing of the Western Front as we planned? I confirmed that the enemy no longer had the strength to break our defences, 
and that we should go on the offensive. The Bryansk front began its counter-offensive on July 12th, and by the end of the day, our forces had broken through German defences and begun advancing toward Oral. On July 13th, I met with Marshal Vasilevsky at General Vatutin's command centre. After reviewing the situation, we decided to intensify our counter-attack and seize the German defence lines near Belgorod. By July 16th, the Germans were pulling back and taking up defensive positions, while our forces pressed forward. The Final Push On July 18th, Vasilevsky and I visited the 69th Army and the 5th Guards Tank Army, where fierce fighting continued. The enemy tried counter-attacks, but our forces, aided by additional reinforcements, gradually pushed them back. By July 10th, the German offensive had collapsed, and their attempts to regroup were frustrated by our constant pressure. Conclusion The Battle of Kursk marked the turning point of the war. The German offensive failed, and Soviet forces, aided by meticulous preparation, superior courage and overwhelming heroism, inflicted a decisive defeat on the enemy. General Vatutin and the Voronezh front commanders, despite criticisms of force distribution, demonstrated remarkable strategic foresight and operational skill in facing the full brunt of the German assault. As I said earlier, we prepared our counter-offensive in the Kursk salient long before the enemy began his offensive. The operations plan, considered at Supreme Headquarters in May, contemplated a counter-offensive in the Orel direction, codenamed Kutuzov. Its objective was to strike at the enemy's forces around Orel from three converging directions, the Central and Bryansk fronts and the left wing of the Western Front. I previously stated that the Bryansk and Western Front offensives began on July 12th and that of the Central Front on July 15th, thus unfolding a powerful three-front offensive with the immediate objective of smashing the enemy's forces in the region of Orel. This counter-offensive, along with the exhaustion of enemy forces around Belgorod, forced the German command to acknowledge that Operation Citadel had failed. In an effort to save its troops from complete defeat, the German command decided to pull Field Marshal Manstein's forces back to the defence lines from which they had launched their offensive. Due to the exhaustion of our own first tank army, along with the 6th and 7th Guards field armies, the enemy managed to pull his main forces back to the Belgorod defence line by July 23rd. When the troops of the Voronezh and Steppe fronts reached the front edge of the German defence line on that date, they were not immediately able to go over to the counter-offensive, as ordered. Before they could do so, fuel stores, ammunition and other supplies had to be replenished, coordination of all the services had to be organised, reconnaissance had to be carried out, and a certain amount of regrouping was essential, especially in artillery and tanks. All this required at least eight days, even on the tightest schedule. After repeated discussion, and with the greatest reluctance, the chief finally approved our decision, as there was no other way out. The forthcoming operation was projected in great depth and required careful preparation and assured supplies. Otherwise, it might fail. A properly prepared offensive must not only guarantee a breakthrough in the enemy's tactical and operational defence in depth, but must also establish a new line to provide proper support for subsequent offensive operations. However, Stalin kept pressing us. Vasilevsky and I had a hard time convincing him of the necessity of avoiding excessive haste and of not starting the operation until it was fully prepared from every point of view. Stalin finally agreed with our arguments. Since his death, it has been said that Stalin never listened to anyone and made military and political decisions by himself. This is not true. If arguments were presented to him in convincing fashion, he listened. I know of cases where he gave up his own views and decisions, as in the case of the starting dates of proposed offensives. The basic plan for the counter-offensive, which had been worked out and approved by the Supreme Commander-in-Chief in May, was repeatedly corrected and discussed anew at Supreme Headquarters during the defensive phase of the Battle of the Kursk salient. This plan for the second stage of defeating the German forces in the areas of Orel, Belgorod and Kharkov was part of the overall summer-autumn campaign of 1943. The first phase, the defensive phase, 
was completed by Soviet forces on the Central Front on July 12th and on the Voronezh Front on July 23rd. The discrepancy in time between these operations stems from differences in the scale of fighting and the fact that the Central Front received the support of the Bryansk and Western Fronts, which went over to the offensive against enemy forces around Orel on July 12th and forced the Germans to pull back seven divisions that had been operating against the Central Front. Nor did the second phase of the battle, the counter-offensive, begin simultaneously on both fronts. Troops near Belgorod did not start their offensive until August 3rd, 20 days after the central Bryansk and western fronts. These three fronts required less time for preparation because their offensives had been planned and all supplies provided during the defensive stage of the battle. The forces near Belgorod required more time because the steppe front lacked a fully developed plan when they were drawn into the counter-offensive. Having been kept in the Supreme Headquarters Reserve, they were not familiar with their precise objectives, their jumping-off areas, or the specific enemy forces they were supposed to engage. While the counter-offensive was being prepared, I spent most of my time with the Voronezh and steppe fronts, except on July 30th and 31, when I visited the 4th Tank Army of the Western Front at Stalin's request. According to the operations plan for the Voronezh and steppe fronts, codenamed Rumyantsev, the main thrust from the Belgorod area was to be carried out by the adjoining flanks of the two fronts, heading in the general direction of Bogodukov, Valky and Novaya Vodolaga, bypassing Kharkov on the west. As soon as our forces reached the Kharkov area, the southwest front was to go over to the offensive. Its 57th Army, commanded by General Enar Gargan, had the task of bypassing Kharkov on the southwest. The counter-offensive of the Voronezh front forces was launched under more difficult conditions than the attack around Orel. They had suffered heavy losses in manpower, materiel and supplies during the defensive fighting. The enemy had been able to retreat to previously prepared defence lines and was thus better prepared to meet our offensive. All indications were that heavy fighting was imminent, especially for the troops of the steppe front who had to attack the fortified Belgorod defence line. On July 23rd, Soviet forces, in pursuit of the enemy, reached the lines north of Belgorod and essentially restored the defensive positions that the Voronezh Front had held up to July 5. After discussing the situation with the front commands, the general staff and Stalin, we decided to halt the advance and begin thorough preparations for the forthcoming operations. Before we could go over to the offensive, the fronts had to regroup their forces and equipment organise thorough target reconnaissance for artillery and air support, replace the losses suffered by the various units, especially the 6th and 7th Guards field armies, the 1st Tank Army and several artillery units, and replenish fuel stores, ammunition reserves and other supplies essential for an offensive in depth. Additionally, the steppe front had to work out its own plan for the counter-offensive and assure the necessary flow of supplies. The general plan for the counter-offensive was as follows. The Voronezh Front. The main blow was to be struck with the 5th and 6th Guards Field Armies, the 5th Guards Tank Army and the 1st Tank Army, in the general direction of Akhtirka. The density of artillery in the proposed breakthrough sector of the 5th and 6th Guards Field Armies was to be raised to 350 guns and mortars per mile of front line and the number of tanks to 70. The divisional sectors were cut down to two miles each. Such a massed concentration was required for a breakthrough because we planned to drive two entire tank armies through the gap on the first day of the offensive. The Steppe Front Under General Konev, consisting of the 53rd and 69th Armies, the 7th Guards Army and the 1st Mechanized Corps, its immediate objective was the seizure of Belgorod, followed by an advance toward Kharkov in coordination with the main force of the Voronezh Front. The steppe front was to be supported by the 5th Air Army under General S. K. Goryunov. In the course of preparations for the steppe front offensive, I had occasion to meet General I. M. Managarov, commander of the 53rd Army. He made a very good impression on me, even though I had to spend a lot of time explaining the operations plan to him. But when the work was done, he took an accordion and beautifully played some lively pieces, 
which immediately lifted our spirits. I looked at him and thought, Soldiers love such merry commanders and will follow them through fire and water. I thanked Managarov for his fine playing and expressed the hope that he would play the artillery overture for the Germans on August 3rd just as well. The counter-offensive at Belgorod began on the morning of August 3rd. Reconnaissance had established that the enemy was rushing motorised and tank divisions and other reinforcements from various sectors to strengthen his forces in the Belgorod-Kharkov area. The heavier artillery and airstrikes were launched by the Voronezh front to open the way for a quick breakthrough by the 5th and 6th Guards armies, reinforced by large numbers of tanks. In the second half of the day, the 1st Tank Army and the 5th Guards Tank Army were thrown into battle, and their advanced units drove as far as 20 miles by the end of the day, completing a breakthrough in the German tactical defence. The steppe front, lacking the powerful artillery and air support of the Voronezh front, saw its offensive proceed more slowly. By the end of the first day, the leading units of the steppe front had advanced almost 10 miles. We regarded this as a great achievement, considering the much stronger and more deeply echeloned defence the steppe front faced. The following day, the German defence stiffened and the steppe front offensive slowed down. However, this did not disturb us, as the shock forces of the Voronezh front were advancing swiftly and threatening to outflank Belgorod on the west. Toward the end of the day on August 4th, the enemy, sensing a trap, began to pull back his forces and abandon positions in Belgorod. The tank armies, artillery divisions and powerful air armies significantly changed our capabilities and, consequently, the character of front operations, not only in scale but also in objectives. Compared to the early period of the war, Soviet forces became far more mobile, which significantly increased the average daily rate of advance. The density of artillery and tanks per mile of front line was sharply raised. During the summer offensive, we were able to create a density of 250 to 300 guns and 25 to 30 tanks per mile of front. One of the decisive factors in the victory at Kursk was the high morale and political conviction of our troops. This was achieved through intensive and painstaking political agitation carried out by commanders, political commissars, party and komsomol organisations, both in the preparatory period and during the battle itself. Soviet guerrillas operating in the enemy's rear also contributed to the Soviet victory at Kursk, Orel and Kharkov. The railroad war conducted by guerrillas in Byelorussia, Smolensk and Orel Oblasts and the Dnieper Valley was particularly effective in cutting enemy supply lines. The guerrillas blew up trains, stations and yards, and provided the Soviet command with intelligence that enabled it to assess the strategic situation and enemy intentions in the summer of 1943. The Battle of Berlin was the culminating and conclusive engagement of the war. It was the most dramatic conflict, the Gotterdammerung of the Third Reich, climaxing with the deaths of Adolf Hitler, Eva Braun, Goebbels and his family, and others in the Führer bunker in the heart of Berlin. This was the moment toward which Zhukov and the Russian commanders had been moving since the tide of war began to turn with Zhukov's first great victory at Moscow in December 1941. It was the moment the Russian people had longed for. The year 1944 saw the Red Army engaged in relentless operations that harassed, pounded and drove the Nazis out of the Soviet Union. Zhukov began 1944 in Ukraine, directing a general offensive across the broad Ukrainian plains. The Soviet military machine was moving smoothly, and by the end of February, when General N. F. Vatutin, commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front, was fatally wounded, Zhukov took his place on March 1st, assuming a direct operational role for the first time since the early days of the war. By late spring, Zhukov returned to his role as Supreme Headquarters Coordinator, this time in the Byelorussian sector, where Operation Bagration, another forefront offensive, began in June. By autumn, the Germans had been expelled from almost the last segments of Soviet territory. The end was near. Stalin's thoughts increasingly turned to grandiose political questions. Who would dominate Eastern Europe post-war? What kind of Germany would emerge? The Polish question grew more acute, 
and Stalin sought a Polish government loyal to him. Politics, once secondary to the survival and defeat of the Nazis, was becoming a dominant factor in Soviet military planning. As 1944 ended, the planning for the final assault on Berlin was well underway. General Antonov, acting chief of staff, and his associates completed the detailed operational plan by early November. The first stage, a strike 150 to 180 miles into German territory to the bidgosch poznan breslau vienna line, was scheduled to take 15 days, followed by another 30 days to crush the Nazi forces and capture Berlin. On November 7, 1944, the great Soviet commanders gathered in Moscow, including Marshals Zhukov, Vasilevsky, Rokossovsky, Konev, Tolbukhin and General Chernyakovsky to consult with Stalin. It was agreed that the final offensive would launch on January 20, 1945, although orders were only issued in December. In the meantime, Stalin made a decision that would alter the course of the battle. Berlin would be captured by Marshal Zhukov, commanding the first Byelorussian front. Although Marshal Rokossovsky had originally led the first Byelorussian front, Stalin reassigned him to command the second Byelorussian front. Zhukov took over the first Byelorussian front on November 16, 1944. Marshal Konev, commanding the first Ukrainian front, also sought the honour of capturing Berlin, but Stalin explicitly restricted the approaches to Berlin to Zhukov's forces. The Soviet armies, under Zhukov, Rokossovsky and Konev, were poised for a massive attack as January 1945 began. By the start of the month, 2.5 million men, 41,000 guns, 6,000 tanks and 6,500 planes were amassed. The Germans had only about 1 million men and a fraction of the Soviet resources in tanks, guns and planes. On January 12th, the Soviet offensive began, one week ahead of schedule, due to Stalin's response to the successful Nazi counteroffensive in the Ardennes. Zhukov's forces broke through Nazi defences with rapid advances. By the end of January, they were ready for the final assault on Berlin. However, the attack halted for a period in February, creating one of the great enigmas of the war. Some historians believe the delay was politically motivated, with Stalin making a strategic decision not to press forward with the attack at that time. Despite these delays, the assault on Berlin resumed in April 1945, with Zhukov's forces in the vanguard. The Soviet commanders, having raced towards Berlin, felt a sense of competition not just with each other, but also with the Western Allies. Stalin's own question to his commanders, who will capture Berlin, us or the Allies, reveals the tense atmosphere of the final push. Ultimately, Zhukov's forces captured the Reichstag and Hitler's bunker. Marshal Zhukov's victory in Berlin marked the end of the war in Europe, but it also signalled the beginning of the Cold War. The disputes over who was responsible for the final capture of Berlin and the tensions between Soviet commanders would echo for decades. The final Soviet assault against Berlin had immense military and political significance. It brought an end to Nazi Germany and determined the post-war fate of Europe. The Soviet Union remained focused on the unconditional surrender of Germany, the liquidation of its fascist regime and the accountability of Nazi criminals for their atrocities. Supreme Headquarters' plan for the final operations, formulated by November 1944, envisaged two major operations, one in East Prussia by the Second and Third Byelorussian fronts, and the other, the Vistula Oder operation, in the direction of Warsaw and Berlin. The first Byelorussian front was to advance toward Poznan, with the second Byelorussian front focusing on East Prussia. The goal was to capture key German positions and secure a final offensive toward Berlin. The final Soviet push toward Berlin, despite its many complexities and challenges, ultimately led to the defeat of Nazi Germany. The operations that culminated in the battle were not just military campaigns, but were also steeped in political manoeuvring, both within the Soviet Union and with the Allies. The bitter arguments and rivalries among Soviet commanders, especially regarding the timing and coordination of the Berlin Offensive, highlight the deep tensions of the final months of the war. 
The plan was that troops of Army Group Vistula, covering their flanks around Grudziads, would break through the Russian front and advance along the valleys of the Warta and Netza rivers toward Kustrin from the rear. This plan has also been confirmed by General Guderian, the former chief of staff of German ground forces. In his book A Soldier's Memoirs, he wrote that the German command intended to strike a powerful counterattack with the troops of Army Group Vistula with lightning speed before the Russians were able to move up large forces or to guess our intentions. This testimony by German military leaders leaves no doubt about the reality of the threat posed by the enemy forces in Pomerania. However, the Soviet command anticipated the enemy's intentions and took the necessary steps against them. At the beginning of February, the Germans had their 2nd and 11th armies between the Oder and the Vistula, a total of 16 infantry divisions, 4 tank divisions, 3 motorised divisions, 4 brigades and 8 battle groups. Our intelligence reported a continuing flow of troops into the area. Moreover, the Germans had their third tank army near Stettin for possible use either around Berlin or to reinforce the East Pomeranian forces, which is what actually happened. Could the Soviet command risk a continued drive toward Berlin in view of this threat from the north? Chuikov says, As for risk, it is often needed in war, and in this particular case, the risk was well founded. Our forces had already advanced 300 miles in the Vistula Oder operation, and from the Oder had only 35 to 50 miles to go to reach Berlin. Of course, we could have ignored the threat and launched both tank armies and three or four field armies straight toward Berlin. But with a thrust from the north, the enemy would have been able to break through our flanks, cut us off at the Oder River, and thus place the troops around Berlin in a precarious situation. History shows that risks should be taken, but not blindly. A useful lesson in this connection is offered by the Red Army's drive against Warsaw in 1920, when a reckless, unsecured advance turned success into a serious defeat. An objective assessment of the strength of the German forces in Pomerania would show that any threat to our troops from that direction could have been localised by the Second Byelorussian Front, Chuikov contends. The facts do not bear out that assertion. The task of eliminating the enemy threat in eastern Pomerania was originally assigned to the second Byelorussian Front, but its forces turned out to be quite inadequate. The offensive launched by the second Byelorussian Front on February 10th made very slow headway. In ten days, its troops advanced no more than 30 to 40 miles. Meanwhile, German forces south of Stargard went over to the counter-offensive and pushed our troops southward by five to eight miles. In view of that situation, Supreme Headquarters decided to move up four field armies and two tank armies of the 1st Byelorussian Front to cope with the East Pomeranian forces, which by then numbered 40 divisions. The enemy's force in eastern Pomerania was able to hold out against both Soviet fronts until the end of March. That is how hard a nut it proved to be. Chuikov contends that the 1st Byelorussian and 1st Ukrainian fronts could have provided eight to ten armies, including three or four tank armies, for an offensive against Berlin in February 1945. I cannot agree with that either. At the beginning of February, the 1st Byelorussian front had only four understrength armies, the 5th Shock Army, the 8th Guards, the 69th and the 33rd Armies, on the Oder River out of a total of eight field armies and two tank armies. The other forces of the front had been redirected to face the enemy in eastern Pomerania, and one corps from both the 8th Guards and 69th Armies were still engaged with the trapped German forces at Poznan. As for the 1st Ukrainian Front, between February 8th and 24, it was still conducting an offensive northwest of Breslau with four field armies, two tank armies and the 2nd Air Army. The enemy, having brought up substantial forces, was offering stubborn resistance. The 1st Ukrainian Front finally reached the Nysa River after advancing 60 miles in a period of 17 days. Its forces attempted to cross the river but failed and therefore took up defensive positions. It must also be borne in mind that our forces suffered heavy losses during the Vistula Oder operation and the average strength of the rifle divisions was down to 5,500 men by February 1st, 
with some as low as 3,800 to 4,800 in the 8th Guards Army. The two tank armies had a total of 740 tanks, with an average of 40 per brigade, and as few as 15 to 20 tanks in many brigades. The situation was roughly the same in the 1st Ukrainian Front. In short, neither the 1st Ukrainian Front nor the 1st Belarusian Front was in a condition to carry out the Berlin operation in February 1945. To exaggerate the capabilities of one's forces is just as dangerous as underestimating the strength of the enemy. This has been demonstrated by the experience of the war and should not be ignored. We must not forget finally about the supply situation of our forces, which had advanced 300 miles in a period of 20 days. At such a high rate of advance, it was natural for the support units to be lagging behind, and the troops were feeling the need for supplies, especially fuel. The Air Force did not have time to move its planes to more advanced bases either. Without analysing the problems of the support services under these conditions, Chuikov writes, If Supreme Headquarters and the Front Headquarters had properly organised the flow of supplies, and had been able to deliver the required amount of munitions, fuel and foodstuffs to the odour in time, and if our air force had been able to rebase itself on airfields near the odour and our pontoon and bridge-building units had assured river crossings for our forces, four of our armies, the 5th Shock Army, the 8th Guards and the 1st and 2nd Tank Armies, could have continued their offensive toward Berlin in early February, advanced another 50 to 60 miles, and completed this gigantic operation with the immediate capture of the German capital. Such iffy statements cannot be taken seriously, even coming from a writer of memoirs. In fact, Chuikov's own acknowledgement that support services, the air force and pontoon units were lagging behind, suggests that under such conditions, a direct drive against Berlin would have been pure adventure. Chuikov writes, on February 4th, the commander of the 1st Belarusian Front, Zhukov, convened a meeting at the headquarters of the 69th Army, including himself, Berzerin, Kolpakchi, Katukov, Bogdanov and myself. We were sitting at map tables discussing the plan for the offensive against Berlin when the direct telephone from Moscow rang. I was sitting nearby and could hear everything. Stalin was calling. He asked Zhukov where he was and what he was doing. The marshal replied that he had gathered his army commanders at Kolpachi's headquarters and was discussing the offensive against Berlin. After Zhukov had finished his report, Stalin demanded, to the surprise of the front commander, as it seemed to me, that he stop this planning and get busy on the operation against the enemy forces of Army Group Vistula in Pomerania. But there never was such a conference at 69th Army headquarters. On February 4th and 5, I was at the headquarters of the 61st Army, which was occupying the right wing of the front in preparation for operations against the enemy's Pomeranian forces, so the talk with Stalin reported by Chuikov could not have taken place. Chuikov also contends that the possibility of capturing Berlin in February 1945 was later raised at a military science conference in Berlin, but that the question was not discussed further because it would have implied criticism of Stalin's actions. True, the question was posed at the conference by a representative of the general staff, Major General S. M. Yenyukov, and not by Chuikov. As far as I remember, and as the stenographic record of the proceedings shows, Chuikov did not comment on the question at all. Now, about the Berlin operation itself. The original idea and plan for the Berlin operation were further developed at Supreme Headquarters throughout the entire period of the Vistula Oda operation. Initially, Supreme Headquarters thought of starting the operation with three fronts simultaneously, but it was later determined that the second Belarusian front, which after the East Prussian operation had to move its forces from the danzig gdynia area to the lower reaches of the Oder, would not have been ready to force the Oder River before April 20th. In view of the existing military and political situation, Supreme Headquarters decided to launch the Berlin operation with two fronts, not later than April 16th. At the beginning of April, Marshal Konev, the commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front, and I were summoned to Supreme Headquarters for the final operations plans for our two fronts. The main thrust toward Berlin and the capture of the city were entrusted to the 1st Belarusian Front. 
the first Ukrainian front was to strike from the Nysa River against enemy forces south of Berlin and cut off the main force of Army Group Center from the enemy forces at Berlin, thus securing the operations of the first Byelorussian front on the south. At this meeting, Stalin also instructed Konev to be ready to strike at Berlin from the south if the enemy managed to put up stiff resistance on the eastern approaches to the city and slowed the advance of the first Byelorussian front. Since the second Byelorussian front would not be able to cross the Oder before April 20th, the first Byelorussian front had to advance with an uncovered right flank in the first crucial days of the operation, and the enemy made an attempt to take advantage of this. General Yodel made the following statement during an interrogation. The general staff knew that the battle for Berlin would be decided on the Oder, and therefore most of the Ninth Army, which was defending Berlin, had been moved to the front lines. Hurriedly formed reserves were to be concentrated north of Berlin for a strike against the flank of Marshal Zhukov's forces. The unusual and highly complex offensive against Berlin required the most careful preparation at all front and army levels. Troops of the 1st Byelorussian Front were expected to break through a deeply echeloned defence zone extending from the Oder River all the way to heavily fortified Berlin. Never before in the experience of warfare had we been called upon to capture a city as large and as heavily fortified as Berlin. Its total area was almost 350 square miles. Its subway and other widespread underground engineering networks provided ample possibilities for troop movements. The city itself and its suburbs had been carefully prepared for defence. Every street, every square, every alley, building, canal and bridge represented an element in the city's defence system. Soviet reconnaissance planes made six aerial surveys of Berlin and all its approaches and defence zones. The aerial photographs were used with captured documents and prisoner interrogations to compile detailed assault maps that were supplied to all commands down to the company level. Army engineers constructed an exact model of the city and its suburbs for use in planning the final assault. Army commanders, chiefs of staffs, members of military councils, the front's political commissar, the artillery chiefs of the front and of individual armies, all corps commanders and service chiefs of the front gathered at a conference from April 5th to 7 for command games using maps and models. Also present was the front's commander of support services, who made a careful study of the problem of ensuring a steady flow of supplies. From April 8th to 14, more detailed games were played at the level of individual armies, corps, divisions, and lower units of all services and the Air Force. Because of the front's overextended communications and the expenditure of supplies on the unanticipated East Pomeranian operation, the first Belarusian front was still not fully provided with supplies by the start of the Berlin operation. Heroic efforts by our support services were required to move up the essential stores in time, but, as usual, they were up to the task. In the course of the preparations, the question of reinforcing the shock effect on the enemy was considered. Since troops are ordinarily most impressionable during the night, we decided to launch the offensive two hours before dawn. To avoid accidents in the darkness, we planned to illuminate enemy positions with 140 searchlights. The effectiveness of searchlights was demonstrated during the preliminary war games, and all participants favoured their use. The use of our tank forces was also thoroughly discussed. In view of the enemy's strong tactical defences on the Silo Heights, we decided to introduce the two tank armies only after the heights had been seized. We did not expect the tank armies to break out into open operational terrain after our tactical breakthrough, as they had in the Vistula Oda and East Pomeranian operations. However, in the actual course of the battle, when the thrust of the first echelon of our front proved inadequate to break through the enemy defences, it was feared that the offensive would be held up. After a discussion with the army commanders late on April 16th, we decided to reinforce the thrust of the field armies with a powerful strike by all our planes and the tank armies. The enemy threw everything he had into the battle, but toward evening on the 17th and on the morning of the 18th, we succeeded in overcoming the defences on the Silo Heights and resumed our advance. Then the Germans moved up substantial forces, including anti-aircraft artillery, which slowed the offensive to some extent. 
we would be delayed again unless we found some way to overcome the resistance of these additional forces. During those days, Stalin was very worried that our offensive would be held up. He therefore ordered the commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front to strike at Berlin from the south, in accordance with the operations plan approved on April 3rd. After heavy fighting, the enemy's defences on the approaches to Berlin finally gave way on April 20th. General Weidling, commander of the Germans' 56th Tank Corps, said during an interrogation, April 20th was the hardest day for my corps, and probably for all the German troops. They had suffered tremendous losses in previous fighting. They were worn down and exhausted, and were no longer able to resist the tremendous thrust of the superior Russian forces. At 1.50pm on April 20th, the long-range artillery of the 79th Rifle Corps of the 3rd Shock Army, under the command of Colonel General Sixth Kuznetsov, was the first to open fire against Berlin, thus laying the basis for the historic assault of the German capital. The following day, elements of the 3rd Shock Army, the 2nd Guards Tank Army, and the 47th Army broke into the outskirts of Berlin and engaged in battle within the city. In addition to these three armies, we also decided to throw the 1st and 2nd Guards tank armies into the battle to crush the enemy's morale and will to fight, to provide maximum support to our weakened field armies, and to speed the capture of Berlin. By that time, we had no other operational assignments requiring the special manoeuvrability of tank forces. The battle soon reached its culmination. We all wanted to finish it off by the May 1st holiday, to give our people something extra to celebrate, but the enemy, in his agony, continued to cling to every building, every cellar, floor and roof. The Soviet forces inched forward, block by block, building by building. The troops of Generals Kuznetsov, Berzarin and Bogdanov moved closer and closer to the centre of the city. Finally, I received the long-awaited call from Kuznetsov, the Reichstag had been taken, our red banner had been planted on it and was waving from the building. What a stream of thoughts raced through my mind at that joyous moment. I relived the crucial battle for Moscow, where our troops had stood fast unto death, envisioned Stalingrad in ruins but unconquered, the glorious city of Leningrad holding out through its long blockade of hunger, the thousands of devastated villages and towns, the sacrifices of millions of Soviet people who had survived all those years, the celebration of the victory of the Kursk salient, and now, finally, the goal for which our nation had endured its great sufferings, the complete crushing of Nazi Germany, the smashing of fascism, and the triumph of our just cause. Most of Hitler's associates, including Bormann, Goering, Himmler, Keitel and Jodl, managed to escape from Berlin. But Hitler and Goebbels, seeing no other way out, ended their lives by suicide. Like passionate gamblers, up to the very last moment they had hoped for that lucky card that might save them and Nazi Germany. As late as April 30th and May 1st, the Nazi leaders were still playing for time, opening talks for a ceasefire in Berlin and calling on Admiral Donitz's newly proclaimed government to negotiate Germany's surrender. General Krebs, an experienced military diplomat, tried by every means to draw General Chuikov into lengthy and disputatious discussions, but that trick did not work either. General Sokolovsky, who had been entrusted with the negotiations, told Krebs categorically that military activities could be halted only by the complete and unconditional surrender of the German forces to all the Allies. The Nazis refused to agree to an unconditional surrender and the talks broke off. Our forces were given the order to finish off the enemy. The Soviet forces launched the final assault on the centre of Berlin at 6.30pm. General Weidling, the commander of Berlin, surrendered with his generals and staff officers at 6 in the morning on May 2nd, declaring that his forces were ready to capitulate. By three o'clock that afternoon, the rest of the Berlin garrison, a total of 70,000 men, had surrendered. It was all over. From the Reichstag, the red banner waved, symbolising the freedom and might of the Soviet people, the land of the Soviets. It had taken just 16 days for the troops of three fronts, the first Bielorussian, the first Ukrainian and the second Bielorussian, to crush enemy forces in the Berlin area and seize the German capital. 
This victory had been made possible by the fact that the Soviet army, nearing the end of the war, was mightier than ever before, both materially and spiritually. The Soviet forces surpassed the enemy substantially in military mastery and operational and strategic skill. For the Berlin operation, the country had supplied the army with forces and supplies that would have been adequate for another operation of the same magnitude. The party of Lenin had done everything possible to inspire the fighting men in their difficult task and to instill in them faith in the success of their just cause. All soldiers, commanders and political commissars had pledged to the party and the nation to pursue the enemy to a victorious end. They were driven by a single desire, to reach Berlin as quickly as possible and make the enemy pay for the sufferings of the Soviet people. The Soviet soldiers, who had travelled the hard road to the approaches of Berlin, were consumed with hatred for the enemy and wanted only to finish him off as quickly as possible, ridding mankind of the threat of fascist enslavement. All the good people of the world who look back on those terrible days of the war, when the fate of mankind hung in the balance, will remember with respect and affection those who did not spare their lives fighting for the common cause, for the fate of their country, and for the freedom and independence of all nations. I find it difficult to single out for special commendation anyone in particular from that final engagement with the enemy. All who participated in the Berlin operation conducted themselves in a manner befitting Soviet soldiers and displayed a high degree of military skill and heroism. The motherland fully appreciated their feats, and now they proudly wear the medal that reads, For the Capture of Berlin. Tens of thousands of soldiers, officers and generals were decorated with orders, while military units that directly participated in the assault on the enemy capital were awarded the honorary title of Berlin. The fall of Berlin and the link-up between the Soviet army and the troops of our allies led to the final collapse of Nazi Germany and its armed forces. The disorganised German army was no longer capable of resistance. Everywhere in Italy and Western Europe, German troops began to capitulate. On May 8, representatives of the German command signed the Act of Unconditional Surrender, acknowledging their total defeat. 1. Stalin's Decisions and Military Disagreements Zhukov's account of the Berlin Offensive is misleading in certain areas. While it is true that all eventualities were considered in the operational plan, it is also important to note that on November 15th, Stalin specifically ordered Zhukov and the 1st Byelorussian Front to lead the drive on Berlin. The operational areas of the 2nd Byelorussian Front and the 1st Ukrainian Front were deliberately designed to ensure Zhukov's path to Berlin, preventing Konev or Rokossovsky from interfering. Konev, aware of this, was unhappy about it. 2. The offensive and political considerations. In January 1945, Soviet forces made rapid advances, achieving their objectives in East Prussia, Silesia and on the Vistula River. This set the stage for the next phase of the operation, the assault on Berlin. General Stemenko described how, after initial successes, Marshal Zhukov proposed continuing his offensive until the capture of Berlin, intending to strike at the German capital from the north and northeast. Meanwhile, Konev, commanding the 1st Ukrainian Front, intended to advance swiftly to Berlin as well. However, Stalin had already given Zhukov clear control over the assault on Berlin. The general staff debated the situation, trying to reconcile Konev's plan with Stalin's orders. They approved both plans, but set a demarcation line that pushed the first Ukrainian front south of Berlin, limiting its direct involvement in the battle. This line caused friction, and the general staff struggled to find a solution. 3. Delays and disputes. The delay in launching the final assault on Berlin sparked controversy within Soviet military circles. Stemenko suggests the delay was due to military necessity rather than political considerations. By January, Soviet intelligence reported strong German forces in Pomerania, threatening the right flank and rear of the advancing Soviet troops. The supply situation was also dire, with ammunition and fuel shortages, which delayed the Soviet advance toward Berlin. This situation forced the general staff to reconsider their strategy. 
However, Stalin's hesitation to launch the final assault in early 1945 might have also been influenced by geopolitical considerations, including the ongoing Yalta Conference and preparations for the post-war world order. Stalin likely wanted to avoid any complications that could arise from a premature push toward Berlin. 4. Final Preparations for the Assault On March 31, 1945, the Soviet General Staff and Front Commanders reviewed the plans for the final assault on Berlin. Marshal Konev voiced concerns about the demarcation line, which excluded his forces from direct participation in the assault. Stalin, after some deliberation, decided to erase part of the demarcation line on the map and allow both Zhukov and Konev to contribute forces to the assault. This decision was crucial to the success of the operation, as it allowed both fronts to advance toward Berlin. The cost of the final battle was enormous. From April 16th to May 8th, the Soviet army suffered 305,000 casualties, killed, wounded and missing, within the first and second Byelorussian and the first Ukrainian fronts alone. This reflected the intense pressure to break through to Berlin and the fierce Nazi resistance. In contrast, the casualties in the Western Front lines were far smaller during the same period. This concludes the recounting of the final stages of the Battle of Berlin and the Soviet role in the collapse of Nazi Germany. It was a monumental and costly victory that brought an end to the war in Europe, marking the Soviet Union's decisive contribution to the defeat of Hitler's regime.